Ellen. We're doing this every day and even several times a day. We're using both the marvelous technology, but also the challenge that our times present to morph our capacity to curate, to collect, to generate uh, engagement content using social media. We're here live on Facebook, but we're also streaming this to YouTube. Our intent is that as we develop capacity, a muscle ability in this arena, that we'll be able to share simultaneously these rich, robust conversations across several platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, and uh, even Periscope. So we want you, if you're connected, to uh, support this, enjoy it, benefit from it. Uh, if you uh, can, start a watch party on Facebook and let your friends know this conversation is going down right now. Beyond that, like it, share it, and uh, raise questions, uh, make statements, uh, let your voice be known. We're monitoring uh, the Facebook feed. This is at the Insight News Facebook page, also at Al McFarland on Facebook, and uh, on YouTube uh, at uh, Al McFarland 1815. That's our address on YouTube. This morning, uh, we have the pleasure of connecting with the organization Youth Prize. Its mission is to increase equity uh, with and for uh, indigenous, low-income, and racially diverse youth. Uh, joining us uh, is the Vice President of Youth Prize, Marcus Hope. Marcus, good morning. How are you doing, brother? Good morning, Mr. McFarland. Uh, glad to have you here. And uh, along with uh, Harry Colbert, Managing Editor of Inside News, we're pleased to engage with you. Let's start off, though, by giving uh, people sort of the Youth Prize 101. Uh, you are an important organization, a necessary organization, but a productive and beneficial uh, resource for our community. Let's let people know exactly the range and scope and the vision behind the Youth Prize uh, proposition. Yeah. So Youth Prize was founded in 2010 by the McKnight Foundation, essentially to, in, to ensure that all Minnesota youth thrive. So we're not a direct service provider, what we do is we mobilize and leverage resources to support youth programs and initiatives and young people directly all across the state. Um, we're a public charity grant maker slash community foundation. Each year we grant out between four and $6 million in the community and we invest roughly another $2 million in initiatives that are supporting young people directly, advocating for policy system changes and reform are providing training to organizations to ensure that they're implementing best practices in serving young people across the state. And one of the things you're doing right now, uh, like everybody else is analyzing what that means in the age of COVID-19. Uh, I wanna introduce my colleague on the program, Harry Colbert Jr. I said, managing editor, managing editor of Inside News, but Harry, you and I, let's uh, connect on uh, this conversation. A lot of organizations and institutions are being challenged. Many are closed, people are working from home. Uh, how is your work affected by COVID-19? And uh, what does it mean to the delivery of the services, not direct services, but of the, the mission that yes. you all have at Youth Price? So what we do um, is we help organizations serve more people and to serve them better. And when COVID-19 hit, the organizations we're concerned about were hit as well um, in terms of youth programs that have to think differently about how do they deliver programming. Uh, their revenue sources are strained, um, particularly if they rely on individual donors or if they have government grants that require them to provide services that require face-to-face uh, -face interaction. So uh, the organizations that we're concerned about are thinking differently about how to do their work. They're, they're strained. And then young people, which is the ultimate uh, group we're trying to impact, are also strained in a number of ways. So we really took a huge pivot uh, mid-March and really focused on a, a, a few things. One, we wanted to offer flexibility to the organizations we supported. So if we were supporting them uh, to do specific things, if it was around workforce or if it was around um, tutoring or technology, we wanted to offer flexibility so that they could use those resources how they see fit, best fit to respond to the crisis. Another thing we, we pivoted to look at was food. We 
we recently hit the 1 million meal mark in terms of delivering food to after school programs, churches, libraries, community centers this year in January. Um, but we really had to ramp up our food program. We had to work to get sites back open. For example, rec centers, community centers, libraries mm -hmm. who are closed. Mm -hmm. We had to think of alternative ways for them to provide food given the need for food at this, this time. So we've been working with the counties, with the cities, to get sites back open so that programs can deliver food um, in a way that's safe, safe utilizing social distancing. We also um, really wanted to think about, we work with the counties around providing individual supports to families, helping families get food, get uh, clothes, basic needs, rent support. Um, and so we've been working with counties to really um, ensure that we're helping families and we're getting gift cards to families, food to families, anything we can do to, to really respond during this unprecedented time. Well, one of the other things that uh, you're doing is uh, right now, um, young learners are learning from home and some people don't have the adequate equipment. Um, yes. But Youth Prize has stepped in there. Talk about that. So we have an initiative called Minnesota After School Advance. And what we do is we help low-income families, families making $35,000 a year or less, um, access, driver's education for their children, tutoring, after-school activities, um, performing arts classes, and this is a $250 million tax credit, and only about 12, between 12 to 15 million is used on an annual basis. And so we were really concerned about that. This is an important resource for low-income families, uh, uh, families of color, and it wasn't being used. So what we did is we partnered with the Venn Foundation and we reached out to uh, individual donors to establish a loan fund to essentially give loans to families to be able to access this credit, which was a huge barrier. Um, as you know, the way tax credit works, you spend the money up front and you get the credit sometimes more than a year later. And if you're a family making $35,000 a year or less, you don't, have an yeah. you don't have the money to, to front. So we eliminated that barrier in terms of the, the cash flow to um, to really support the program. So initially, we weren't we weren't working in the area of providing laptops. We were strictly focused on summer camps, after school activities, performing arts uh, classes, and such. But when COVID nineteen hit, we realized that distance learning was the the new reality, and we wanted to use this tool to help families access distance learning opportunities and to have the equipment necessary. Some districts provide equipment. Um, others don't, and there's a huge need for resources to help families uh, access uh, laptops and computers. And so that's what we did. We, we uh, reached out to the community. We got on Facebook. We got on social media. Uh, we reached out to existing families. Um, and thus, thus far, we've uh, deployed over, I think, about 200 laptops to families. Uh, there is a family contribution, and we've scholarship the family contribution. I think we've uh, offered over seven thousand dollars in con in, uh, in scholarships to date. Um, we worked on supply chain issues. We were working with trying to access computers through Amazon, Best Buy, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, the supply was limited. So we worked out an issue, and we we purchased uh, Chromebooks by the pallet. Um, in addition to helping families through Minnesota After School Advance, we've also helped other youth programs. So you've got, a, you've got an, an inventory of Chromebooks right now, apparently, right? Yes, we have an so inventory. Can, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question, how many Chromebooks are on a pallet? So we just purchased a pallet of 200 Chromebooks, and I okay. think we're probably down to less than 100 now. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah. So we're, we're looking at, we need to make another purchase, but a lot of programs, small programs are trying to access Chromebooks to really transform their programs. Mm -hmm. So in addition to supporting individual families with Chromebooks, we've been connecting with youth programs who are, who are in need of Chromebooks and helping them get them at a low cost mm -hmm. um, as well. That's wonderful. That's great. Uh, Harry, another question? Go ahead. So you mentioned um, the um, income, $35,000 or less. What what are uh, the other um, kind of Barrier. barriers or qualifications that someone would need to participate? Yeah. So income is a huge barrier. 
um, just navigating the process of securing the credit and doing your taxes correctly is another barrier that we help families with. Um, understanding what's eligible and making what's eligible uh, available, so linking families with the opportunity um, and in a way where they know the credit will work um, and they won't be disappointed at the end of the year when they do their, or when they do their taxes. Um, even now with the role we play in terms of uh, basically fronting the money for the family, there's about like 26 steps that a family has to go through to work with us. So one of the things we do is we do policy advocacy. We just had a Senate tax committee hearing this morning uh, where we're advocating to raise the income guidelines. This credit has been in existence for 20 years and the income guidelines haven't ad adjusted for inflation. Mm -hmm. So you have families on free, free lunch um, and they can't access this credit to be able to provide opportunities for their children. And so that's a, something we're working on um, to change. Yeah, because you can have a family uh, that's making forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000, but if you've got three children in the household and child care and other needs of that nature, it, it certainly stretches the, the budget for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Marcus, uh, to talk about uh, your own personal path and how you've come to the work. You obviously are passionate about what you do, and I want to compliment you on the dedication that you and your colleagues bring to the service of our community. Uh, compliment the organization Youth Prize for both vision and results that uh, it delivers. But how did you come to this work? You're a, a St. Paul native, I understand? Yep. So I grew up in Frogtown in St. Paul and uh, went through the St. Paul public school system. And very early on, I got connected to, to high quality opportunities um, at place like, places like the Halle Q. Brown Center and at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And so I had opportunities to learn and grow and develop in addition to the support I had from my family. Um, and that stuck with me, that struck me. So when I got in school, um, I took an early path into youth development. That's what I wanted to do, to work in the area, to have an impact on young people uh, in the community. So I, um, I started out early working, you know, for the Science Museum, directing camps um, all across the metro area, uh, and then worked in adolescent shelter, uh, had an opportunity to direct youth programs in North and South Minneapolis uh, through the Neighborhood Involvement Program. Uh, and then took a turn in my career uh, while working on my master's at the University of Minnesota and worked for an institute focused on uh, violence in the black community, the Institute mm -hmm. on Domestic Violence in the African American mm -hmm. Community. Some of you are familiar with Dr. Oliver Williams. Oh, sure. Who's been, who's been a leader in that work. So I worked for him for a number of years doing national um, training, technical support uh, to federal grantees and to victim service providers on how to address that issue from a culturally relevant perspective. And we also did some national policy work, um, publications, uh, um, special, special issue journals on the issue, chapters, book. You know, Dr. Oliver Williams did a lot, you know, busy man. Oh, prolific, prodigious, yeah, right, yeah, certainly. Yeah, he's done a lot of work. And so worked for, for him for five years, um, and I got connected to him while working in the youth development department at the School of Social Work. And then, you know, and if you know Dr. Williams, he travels a lot. So I was traveling a lot with him uh, and wanted to take a, a, a turn and kind of be more local and have more local impact. And the Youth Prize, when McKnight Foundation, Foundation was starting Youth Prize, Wokey uh, invited me to be a part of her team, her leadership team. Wokey Wea. Wokey Wea, our president and CEO, to be a part of her leadership team which was a great, great opportunity that I couldn't say no to. Um, and so I've been at Youth Prize for nine years in November. It'll be nine years. Uh, well, congratulations. I often fine. ask our guests, and particularly our people, to uh, talk about where they come from in the sense of we acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders. And you've done that by talking about uh, both uh, Oliver Williams and Wookie Wea, but also your family. And uh, I mentioned to you before we went on camera that my family is in part from Mississippi, my yeah. wife's family, Mississippi. And uh, though you mentioned St. Paul, 
I mm -hmm. like to ask my guests to talk about their, their mom and their dad, you know, their mm -hmm. grandparents. What is it in the lineage that brings you to this point of service uh, and of expectation in your personal life? So yeah. brag a little bit about uh, who you yeah. are and who got you here. Yeah, well, I come from a family of, of, of servants, you know, serving the community um, and serving a higher power. And as you mentioned, I'm from the, you know, my family comes from the Delta region. Both of my parents grew up, you know, in, you know, in that region in, in, in Mississippi. And it's, it's, you know, I say the heart and soul of me is from Mississippi because that's, you know, that's where it comes from. And, you know, one person that had a huge impact on my life is my grandmother. You know, she died at, I think it was 93, you know, in 2006. So I got to spend a lot of time with her and learn a lot from her. What was her name? Letha Tyler. Okay. And she had, um, she had an eighth grade education uh, because that's all the opportunities that a lot of times a woman of her generation could have. Mm -hmm. Um and we have, I have a lot of cousins who have advanced, you know, we, a lot of us have advanced degrees and very important, important titles, but none of us would ever say we were smarter than our grandmother and mm -hmm. she would never allow it. Um, mm -hmm. And we knew that um, despite the formal education, um, I have a value of, of our elders in our community who have, uh, like you said, um, that we are standing on uh, to be in the positions we're in right now. So, so given that, how do we uh, address what we hear from time to time, uh, the uh, perceived or described disconnect between young people and elders? Uh, I, I think there's some language there, but the language is more than the reality. I think that there is beneath it a sense of continuity and a sense of uh, movement and continued development that really characterizes uh, the, uh, the long arc uh, of our movement as African people uh, yeah. in the West. But I know too that uh, every generation uh, is anxious to make its own mark uh, and to do its own work to follow its calling. How do we do that at, from your point of view right now? And where do you see us going in the future uh, to protect both legacy, but also to dream a future that reflects the, uh, the gift of our existence? What do you think? That's a great question, and I'll touch on that. I just want to, Wokey would be upset if I didn't mention one thing that's relevant to your question. One one thing that's unique about Youth Prize is our structure. Mm. Uh, we believe in youth adult partnerships. Mm -hmm. So our board structure is uh, half of our board members are, are young people between up to the ages, and we define young people up to the age of, of 25. So we've intentionally, when you talked about our mission, uh, with and for, include those who we're trying to serve in our leadership structure. And we think that's important. So, but to get to your question, um, I think it's a very important question. We're so polarized in our society in so many areas around race, around age, um, around geography, uh, that um, I think it's a huge barrier to progress. Um, and I think, we need mutual opportunities to engage one another, to listen to one another and respect each other's realities. Um, you know, having a grandmother that lives so long, you know, there's certain things that are instilled in me around the struggle uh, that those who came before me that there's no way I wouldn't appreciate that. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is we have certain um, we have some young people that have, don't have the connections to that legacy are further away. My, my oldest grandparent was born in 1900 in Uniontown, Alabama. Um, and so we have some folks my age, you know, I'm 39, who don't have, you know, as strong of a connection to the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, and, and, and so forth so that it's hard to understand because of their proximity to the issue. And so I think we need opportunities to dialogue. And with younger folks, you know, you know, given our age makeup, people call me old at Youth Prize or some <laughs> of the staff. Um, so that, you know, and that's, that tells you something about um, kind of where we're at and how disconnected we are. So I think we need more opportunities to gauge across generations. And I think we need to do it openly um, uh, across both sides, you know, I mean, I think elders, um, 
you know, and I understand the elder, you know, you listen to your elder, you know, and that's, that's what I come from. At the same time, I've grown in my work at Youth Pride in terms of listening to young people telling, you know, offering their perspective. And I've grown from hearing their perspective. I may not agree with everything, mm-hmm. um, but I think I've grown and I've, I understand kind of the context in which they live and how it may be different. And I understand how they, had, they don't, may not have certain connections to history and legacy. Um, and experiences that I may have had the privilege of being connected to, given the people I've had in my life who have elders and had certain experiences. So I think we just have a disconnect across our communities in a number of ways, um, because everybody's so segregated by age, by race, by geography. Um, and I think that's very, and socioeconomic status. I mean, I think we have um, uh, folks who have achieved certain, certain wealth and certain class status that may not connect to um, certain young people in certain communities, even within our own community. And I think that's something we have to reconcile. You know, I think one of the things historically, um, back in your day, there was a sense of collective consciousness because I think everybody felt like they were in the same boat, you Mm -hmm. know, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about black people now, I don't know if everybody is identifying with one another in the same way they may have back in your day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we need to address um, and address across generations um, if we're going to have progress and we're going to be unified to uplift our entire community, Black community specifically. So let's close on this note. If, let's say that you're right in your analysis and expectation and that we are effective, successful in addressing concerns like that. In your mind's eye, uh, what does the future look like? If you could project uh, your vision, your dream out, say, 50 years, where will African people be? Where will people be uh, based on the values and the experiences that we are bringing to community and to the planet? What do you think? I think the future is bright. Um, We have work to do, but I think the future is bright. Um, I see um, our elders sticking in um, and sticking with it. And I see some amazing young people um, who are passionate and committed uh, to this. So I think in our, our legacy, our pedigree is strong. Uh, so I'm confident, um, but I'm not, um, I'm not naive about the work that we need to do um, together. Great, great comment. Great answer. Harry, final questions or comments? Um, for someone who is interested in the program, uh, you have some web addresses for us for you prize and also to access the uh, tax credit or laptop. Yep. If you go to www.youthprize.org, you can access um, information about Minnesota After School Advance and our different grants. We also, you know, the interview went quick. We also released about over $300,000 in emergency grants to organizations. We focused on organizations primarily led by people of color and small to mid-sized organizations with budgets under $2 million um, to make sure we're targeting those most in need and those most impacted by disparities. Um, But we're doing a lot, Um, we can do more, and we're gonna try to do everything we can to to really be a a part of the community and help advance things and get through this pandemic. You know, we have time, we don't have to rush this. So if if you wanna say more, please do. And I thought earlier on, uh, Marcus, and I failed to bring it back up, it would be awesome for you to acknowledge some of the work of your partners and community. Uh, tell people uh, if what comes to mind on you know relationships that you fund and support, uh, so that people get a sense of where this activity uh, is actually uh, developing in the community. What do you think about that? Yeah, I can talk about some of our. Let's see, some of the grants we released. We funded thirty-one organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, of those, twenty-six percent. Actually, 49% were suburban African descent organizations Mm -hmm. um, that are focused on that. 16% American Indian, 6% uh, Latinx, 6% Asian and Pacific Islander. We 10% uh, were focused on low income in greater Minnesota, Mm -hmm. um, because that's another. um, And then 6% serving multiple communities. Some organizations you may be familiar with, JK The Movement, Juxtaposition, mm-hmm. Kaju, We Win Institute, Walker West Music Academy, um, 
so a number of organizations that great organizations doing, that are doing great work yeah um and we're going to do everything we can to continue to um to, to support these organizations and they receive ten thousand dollar emergency fund grants. Mm -hmm. we hope to do more throughout the year um mm -hmm. but we tried to do something really quickly and kind of to get we know it's tough times for organizations now another thing we're doing is we're working with um with the city and the county to roll out uh food distribution in mm -hmm. uh certain communities uh and cer at certain sites in saint paul we hope to do that in in hennepin county as well um to expand our work there mm -hmm. um to get meals for evening meals school districts are doing a great job of breakfast and lunch we want to get evening meals and weekend meals to families we've done some one-off kind of getting gift cards to groups that are doing food uh, distribution and grants, mm -hmm. emergency grants there. So, so Great, that's that. Wonderful. wonderful. Well, uh, thank you so much, Marcus Pope, <laughs> Vice President of Youth Prize, uh, article on Youth Prize in online right now at uh, www.insightnews.com. In the, the print edition, uh, it'll be appearing in is uh, Monday, next Monday, the 27th. So look for that article in Insight News. Harry, thank you for uh, co-piloting here as always. And um, Marcus, one more time, contact information. People want to reach you. www.youthprize.org. Www uh, my email is my email is very simple. Marcus, my first name at youthprize.org. So don't hesitate to reach out to me directly if you have any questions. Super, Harry. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. for. So Harry, you. we're Stay on the, safe. We're on again yeah. later today, right, Harry? We're doing yeah, another. Yeah, so we'll be uh, uh, joined by Dr. Uh, Rwanda Campbell at 2.30 today. So uh, okay. we'll be back here at Insight News uh, Facebook page and also share to my personal page, your personal page, and mm -hmm. hopefully uh, many of the community members will share it as well. Right, and then tomorrow we're meeting again with our panel of physicians um, uh, organized by Dr. Inel uh, Roselle, who, who has been, Rosario, who's been convening uh, black and brown physicians to talk about uh, how we are responding. I think we're gonna be joined by a physician who's on the ground also in Puerto Rico. Uh, so that'll be another addition for tomorrow's program. And then we've and announced that- tomorrow's program. That's tomorrow's program, right? Yeah. At, it's one o'clock, yeah. one tomorrow, uh, Facebook. And then um, Monday, we'll come back with uh, sort of launching uh, and continuing the public policy forum, uh, a group of leadership people. We want everybody in the community to tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11, 10 to 11.30, where we try to have an organized and broad approach to community issues values, challenges, and the voices of leaders uh, and uh, workers uh, bringing um, our concerns forward, sharing and enabling each other to be our best selves. Well, I'm Alan McFarland. Thank you for tuning in right now. Like this program, share it uh, in the future, try to do Facebook watch parties, and we want to grow uh, this engagement, and you are the key. We thank you for being a part of this. Take care. We'll see you later today. See you at 2.30.